six, uh, this week we're going to tackle two chapters, chapter 6 and chapter 7. Chapter 6 deals with uh, <clears throat> the self and personality, <clears throat> and chapter 7 uh, deals with multiculturalism. Uh, we're going to start off with self, the self and personality. Uh, back in 1960, oh, I'm sorry. Back in 1960, Kuhn came up with a test called the 20 Statements Test. It's a very simple test. <clears throat> you have uh, 20 lines, and you're supposed to fill them up with who you are and who, uh, who you, uh, with who you are. <laughs> so you respond to the 20 questions, or, or it's actually 20 statements. You just make 20 statements about yourself, and, and you have... Um, a select amount of time to do it in, like 15 or 20 minutes. It's uh, unusual in utilizing an open question methodology, making coding uh, non-straightforward, so it's, it's really kind of difficult uh, to, to uh, score. Um, uh, he stated that responses uh, to the 20 statements test should be grouped in five categories. This is what Kuhn, this is how he was grading it. Uh, he said social groups and classifications would be one group, ideological beliefs would be another group, uh, interests another group, ambitions another group, <clears throat> and then self-evaluations another group. Um, in other words, this is it. Uh, who are you? Uh, who am I? And uh, I am, and you're supposed to finish those statements. The 20 statements test is one of the most widely used cross-cultural psychological measures, as weird as this sounds. Um, uh, psychologists really uh, like it because it gives them an idea of how people in that culture think about themselves. Uh, one of the things we discovered was that Americans uh, most often mentioned uh, personal traits, uh, their attitudes and their abilities. Uh, I'm a baseball player. I'm a, I'm a good kisser. Evidently, that's what this lady is talking about, uh, which accounted for about f uh, half of their, their self-description, just a little under half. Uh, the American pattern is similar to many other Western cultures. Australia had the same, uh, the same thing, uh, England, uh, Sweden, and Canada. Uh, they were all about 50% about who you, uh, um, about your personal traits, your attitudes, and your personal abilities. When other cultural groups were given the same major, the results are very much different. The Maasai and the Samburu of Kenya had only 2% of their self-descriptions reflect personal characteristics. 60% uh, of their description encompassed their social membership and their roles in that society. But Westerners, not so much. The Maasai and the Samburu pattern of a, a greater emphasis on roles and memberships appears in cultures from much of the rest of the world, and these cultural differences are already evident among kindergarten children. Uh, they looked at Ki uh, Cook Islanders, and they saw exactly the same thing. Malaysians, the Chinese, Native Americans, other Africans besides Kenyans, uh, Puerto Ricans, uh, Indians, Asian Indians, of course, and Japanese. These are Cook Islanders. That's what Cook Islanders look like. A Danish study of Ma et al. in 2012 uh, looked at functional MRIs when participants were evaluating personal characteristics. The Danish participants showed no difference in their functional MRIs when they considered their social roles or their personal characteristics. Both involved the medial prefrontal cortex, which is typically activated in self-judgment. And this is the medial uh, prefrontal cortex right here. And there it is again. I think. Yep, that's it. Medial prefrontal cortex. This is activated when you're thinking about yourself. When the researchers performed the same functional MRIs on Chinese participants, their medial prefrontal cortex was only activated when they were considering personal characteristics. When the Chinese thought of their social roles, their Temporoparietal uh, junction was activated, and that's this area right here. Uh, this is a region that more typically is involved in understanding other people's beliefs. So, other what other you were thinking about, what they were thinking about, was what other people were thinking about them, <laughs> their social roles. 
In other words, you know, my grandfather gave me this this task to do. Uh, my my father thinks I do this, or or my mother tells me I need to do this. Those are the social. That's that's how they get their social roles. And so the uh, temporal parietal junction was uh, the uh, area that was activated. This is the temporal parietal junction right here. So this area is the part that's being activated. Ma et al. in 2012 suggests that the Chinese participants were more likely thinking about other people's beliefs when they thought about their social roles. Though uh, we are all individuals, humans are also a highly social species. Social interaction is a continuous balancing act between focusing on our differences and seeking our connection with others. And this is an interesting picture. Actually, what he's done is taken his own face and superimposed it on everybody in this picture. So the, all of these faces are his, are the, uh, are the artist's face. Marcus and Kiriyama uh, first identified the independent view of the self in 1991. Independent individuals experienced their identities as largely distinct from their relationships. Independent individuals are self-defining, their attitudes, their personality traits, their preferences, their opinions, abilities, and individual qualities. Now, you can imagine, uh, I started uh, studying psychology in 1976, um, and the independent view of the self didn't become um, stated until 1991. Uh, so I was studying psychology for 15 years before this was even an idea. So you can see how psychology has changed, and it's continually evolving. Uh, so you're studying something that uh, you may have a, a, a huge hand in, in determining uh, how people think in the future. Um, how they think today may not be the way they think in the future, how they thought in the past, or how we describe how they thought in the, fa in the past uh, may be completely different from what we see uh, in the future. And of course, one of the things that is influencing people uh, today uh, is social media and uh, new news organizations. Um, so these things may have a huge impact on what happens in the future as compared to when I was young. Uh, when I was young, the only social media we had was television. And it was a one-way one street. Uh, television just had information and they threw it at you and that was it. That was all you, the only possibility that you had was changing channels and looking at another news program. But now you can select your news and that may be tribalizing, may be changing people. Uh, they they uh, may be uh, only reading things uh, that uh, that agree with with uh, some strange, some interesting mindset that they have. Um, anyway, the independent view of the self didn't come in until 1991, and uh, so what was going on in 1991? Um, um, well, um, I can't think of anything <laughs> really. Oh uh, no, that's not uh, the um, first uh, Arab Iraq War started, uh, or the first. Uh, U.S. invasion of Iraq came in 1993, uh, so there were there were uh, people were worried that uh, Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction and that he was going to use them against against people <coughs> against his neighbors. Um, I can't think of anything that was going on in 1991. Uh, the self's experiences are rather stable and does not change much from situation to situation. Uh, the independent uh, view of self is experienced as self-contained and exists as a relatively coherent and inviolate entity. Now, this is really kind of interesting because if you think of mental health and, uh, and treatment for mental health, one of the things that we try to do is change the way that we see ourselves uh, so that uh, we are, are, we do away with this idea that that we are pathological. We uh, right now they're having pathological ideas, uh, so we have to to get them to stop identifying with that pathological idea or that thought. Uh, that's part of, of of psychology, and that's what uh, 
uh, cognitive behavioral therapy does. Um, it, it changes the way that you think about yourself. Relationships vary and are fluid as individuals tend to be closer uh, to close relations than to distant relations. Individuals with independent identities still feel much closer to in-groups than out-group members. However, they do not view them in fundamentally distinct ways. The main bifurcation is between self and non-self, and both in-group and out-group members are non-selves. Marcus and Kitty Yama in 1991 also identified the interdependent self. The self overlaps quite a bit with an individual's significant relationships. Interdependent individuals are closely connected with others and are not experienced uh, as distinct, unique entities. And that's the interdependent self. You may be surprised to find out how many people in the world can, are, are more interdependent than independent. Interdependent entities are grounded in their relationships with others. Relationships come in a variety of forms, and they require people to take on particular roles, such as father, student, friend, lover, daughter, uh, that uh, govern how, how they feel and behave toward their relationship partners. The identity of the interdependent individual is experienced as somewhat fluid in different situations. Depending on the situation and the role that the person occupies in that situation, the person's experience uh, of their self will vary accordingly. Uh, so you are different selves with different people. Uh, so if, you're, uh, if you are a parent and you're dealing with your child, then you act one way. Uh, you, you probably act differently with your uh, parents than you do with your instructors as a student. Uh, if you have friends that are the same age as you, you probably act different around them than you would around your professor or around your parent. And of course, your significant other, uh, you would act different, differently with them than you would with your friends uh, or your father or your, or your uh, professor. Uh, so we have different uh, personas that we project uh, when we are around different people. Relationships with one's in-group members are self-defining for those with interdependent selves. Thus, the people in the in-group assume considerable importance. People do not easily become in-group members, nor do close relationships easily dissipate into out-group relations. Uh, and as we can see, these are all superheroes, but Spider-Man sitting uh, away from the three Batmen. And the three Batmen are really close to each other. This is an in-group and this is an out-group. Um, if we were talking about superheroes, they would all be together, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about Batman, and we're talking about Spider-Man. <laughs> In 2007, Zhu, Zhang, Fan, and Han conducted an interesting functional MRI experiment on Western and Chinese participants. They asked the participants whether select trait adjectives characterize themselves or their mothers. So they needed to think of, does this adjective fit me, or does it fit my mother, or does it fit us both? Now this was really kind of curious. Westerners showed different regions of the brain activation, suggesting that they represent themselves and their mothers in distinct way. That this is the way my mother is, this is the way that I am. So they were distinct, and they activated different areas of the brain. But when the Chinese were evaluating themselves or their mothers, they showed activation patterns in the same regions for the two tasks, the medial prefrontal cortex, an area linked with self-representations. In other words, they thought of themselves as a continuation of their, of their mother. Independent selves have a number of close relationships with members of their in-group. However, these relationships are less self-defining than are the corresponding relationships of those with more interdependent selves. This is one of the reasons why I don't, why I don't join organizations. I don't want that organization to define who I am. But a lot of people say, oh, you're a member of uh, uh, the VFW, or you're a member of the Republican Party, so you must have these ideas. And you're a member of the NRA, so you must have these ideas. I don't belong to any of those groups, of course, because I don't join groups so that people won't define me. I want to define myself. 
so but but a lot of people you know they they uh, they would rather have their relationships define them uh, interdependent cells identify more strongly with their in-group uh, while independent cells have a more permeable relationship and that's me I'm mr. permeability because in-group relations are so critical for self-definition for people in more interdependent cultures and because they serve to direct appropriate behaviors, it is especially necessary to identify those with whom one has such significant relationships. Obligations to others are an important part of the in-group relations among interdependent people, so it is of vital importance for them to distinguish those toward whom they have obligations from those they do not. Becoming a member of an interdependent individual's in-group is thus a rather substantial accomplishment, and such relationships should be entered cautiously. And this is a picture from Clockwork Orange. This is the group uh, uh, from the Clockwork Orange. And as you can see, they all dress the same. They are all wearing combat boots. They all wear white clothes. They have this strange jockstrap thing on, and they all have black hats on. So that signifies uh, which group they belong to. A more independent person is likely to perceive themselves as existing and functioning separately from the social environment. The environment is more tangential uh, to the independent person's identity. Relationships can be formed and broken without having a large impact on the independent person's identity. And this is really kind of interesting because as a military member, we move a lot. We moved a lot, and so you make friends at a select base, and then after two or three years, you got to move. So, you know, the friends that you had before may still be your friends, but you're not going to come in contact with them because you've gone to, to one base, and they've gone, you know, around the world somewhere. So the probability that you'll run into them or interact with them is fairly remote. So it forces you to be an independent person. People with independent cells are more willing to form new relationships, uh, maintain larger networks of friendship relationships, and be less distressed should the, uh, any of these relationships fade away over time. And of course, that's what happens when you're in the military. You usually only spend three years someplace. You might like it a lot. You might have a lot of friends downtown might have a lot of friends on base, but as soon as you leave, you've, uh, you know, all of you, <laughs> I don't even remember any of my, my zip codes or telephone numbers from all the places that we have lived. And that's, that's being, re that's being independent. And of course, you're forced into being independent by uh, the nece necessity of the job. The job is that you're doing what the federal government needs you to do to, to protect the United States in whatever way you're protecting the United States and you go from one assignment to the next willingly because that's your job. For independent persons, in-groups and out-groups are less consequential to self-construction. So you learn to be your own person. Um, and this is one of the things that I thought about when I first joined the military. Um, uh, my first assignment I trained in Texas. I uh, had basic training in in San Antonio, and then my uh, my uh, training to be a medic was in uh, Wichita Falls, Texas. And I, you know, I, I so I spent a considerable amount of uh, considerable amount of time in Texas. So I could have started acting like somebody from Texas. That's the best way to get along is to act like somebody from Texas. But I made a conscious effort to maintain my, my Midwestern uh, mindset, my Midwestern attitude. Uh, and and I, I maintained that throughout uh, my uh, military career. I, I grew up in, in Indiana, and that's the person I wanted to be. And, and that's the person I remain to this day, even though my... Some of my brothers don't think that I act very <laughs> much like they do. <laughs>
There is a con uh, convergent evidence of heightened distinction between in-groups and out-groups among those who are more interdependent. Collectivistic cultures such as the Japanese, uh, they richly describe this pronounced difference in behavior uh, between contexts involving in-groups, and in Japan they call it uchi, uh, that's your, your buddies, your BFFs, your, your friends that act like you do. And those involving outgroups, those are soto, those are, those are people that aren't like you, uh, that don't do the same thing that you do. And this is a picture of, of girls that have gotten together and everybody decided which Sailor Moon they were going to be, or which outfit, Sailor Moon outfit they were going to wear. So we've got green, blue, uh, lavender, pink, red, and yellow Sailor Moon uh, girls. And actually, in Japan, if you know, of course you've never been to Japan, but if you've ever, if you had ever been to Japan, you see people walking around like this from time to time, wearing uh, interesting outfits, like it's Comic Con. Uh, studies have found that Asian Americans were more accurate than the European Americans in identifying the emotions experienced by their close friends. European Americans were more accurate than Asian Americans in identifying the emotions that were experienced by strangers. And this is a study by Ma Kellams and Blaskovich in 2012. Uh, in other words, if uh, uh, Asians pay a lot more attention to their in-group and European Americans pay more attention to everybody, everybody around them. So they were able to identify emotions. Independent cells, European Americans, uh, more interdependent cells, Asian Americans. In places like Japan, where commitment to in-group members is strong, there should be a less uh, should be less of a willingness to cooperate with outgoing members. People with interdependent cells focus their trust on people they share more kind. Uh, they share some kind of relationship. Yamagishi and Yama, uh, Yamagishi in uh, 1994 found that Americans tend to have higher levels of general trust than the Japanese do because the Japanese are more focused on their in-group. And Americans, as it being independent, uh, they're more likely to, uh, well, they can identify strangers' emotions better uh, because they are focused not just on their own small group, but on everybody else. So it's easier to be paranoid in an interdependent um, uh, country or a country that has a lot of interdependence. Bond and Smith in 1996 found that people with more interdependent views of self are more likely to conform than those with more independent views. This may be because people with more interdependent selves view in-group members as an extension of themselves while maintaining distance from out-group members. This is a picture uh, that was drawn uh, when American sailors first arrived in Japan. And this is a picture of an American sailor. And as you can see, a lot of facial hair. The Japanese have very little facial hair, if any at all. Uh, this is a really hairy thing. He almost looks like some kind of a monster, which is really kind of interesting. When we were in Japan, uh, we went to a parade in uh, Masawa, uh, and there, the enemies of the samurai were all these monsters. And, and of course, you're thinking, well, this must be mythical. Uh, but the reality is they see enemies as monsters. So anybody that is an enemy is a monster. And you can see the long nose, uh, the strange ears, uh, eyebrows that go all the way up into the, into the hairline, uh, the heavy beard, uh, the red lips, big lips. Uh, the Japanese um, admire small mouths. And here we've got this massive mouth. <clears> Has <throat> hair on his neck. What could be worse? Anyway. This is how they, how they drew uh, Americans when, when Americans first arrived in Japan. And that was in the 1840s. It was a closed country until then. They wouldn't allow anybody else to, to land. And uh, the American merchantmen were trying to force the Japanese to uh, open up their ports to trade. 
and uh, it was the Amer the American Navy that that uh, that actually did that. Uh, because of that, they were pretty upset with the United States, uh, so they uh, opened up their ports to American shipping, but they also opened up their ports to English shipping, and because the English didn't force them to open their ports, uh, they started copying the British. Uh, so even to this day, if you go to Japan, uh, the Japanese drive on the left side of the road, just like the English do. Uh, and they also uh, speak a more uh, English-based language than, uh, than American-based, even though uh, we occupied them uh, in the uh, late 1940s, early 1950s. 1983, IBM tasked psychologist Gert uh, Hofstede uh, to uh, assess their employees' opinions and interests. Hofstede administered questionnaires to 117,000 employees in 40 different countries. And of course, IBM was the original, uh, they, the, uh, IBM made that, it means international business machine. Uh, so they made, made all these copiers and they made uh, calculators and whatnot. Uh, and they had to decide whether they were going to move into computers and they decided not to. Um, Eventually they did, and then they, they didn't really do very well. Uh, so they went back to, to uh, business machines. But um, they were the, one of the largest companies in the, United, in, in the world. Um, General Motors was larger, I think. Uh, but they, uh, IBM was, was an international uh, organization with, obviously, with, uh, with employees all over the world <clears throat> in 40 different countries. Uh, so they so IBM wanted them to, to discover or, or to, to determine uh, the level of individualism in all of these com countries so that they could map out how they were going to control uh, so many different people. They needed to write rules that fit everybody. So they were this is part of their problem. Um, you know, if you're if you're a company that uh, is only ba only in the United States, you really don't have to worry about different cultures dealing with different cultures because you're only dealing with one culture. But here's IBM, their international business machine, uh, and they have off they have uh, employees in 40 different countries. So Hofstad was uh, able to map the individualism of all the employees in each country. The country scores show a clear and striking pattern. Hofstadt discovered that the most individualistic country in the world is the United States, closely followed by other English-speaking countries and by Western European nations. Uh, countries that scored high in collectivism were various nations in Latin America and in Asia. Other research has found similar results. Now, why I, I showed a, I'm showing you a picture of Kim Kardashian, I'm not exactly sure. Her family is... Armenian, not that that's important. Of course, they've been in the United States for an extended length of time. But uh, I guess they, they show a lot of, uh, of individualism. Collectivism uh, has been found to dominate in Asia, Africa, Southern Europe, Eastern Europe, and uh, the South Pacific. Most people participate in collectivistic cultures where interdependent cells are more common uh, these countries encompass more than 80% of the world's population, and that's what I was talking about before. So 80% of the world's population are more in interdependent than independent. The state with the highest collectivism score by far was Hawaii, probably because of the state's large population of people with Asian ancestry. Uh, the next most collectivistic states were Utah and the states of the Confederate South. Uh, that's uh, the uh, Old South, uh, Tennessee, Alabama, Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, <laughs> uh, Texas, uh, I said Alabama, Arkansas. Uh, the least collectivistic states were in the Mountain West, the Great Plains, the Northeast, and the Midwest. And of course, I was born in the Midwest, but now I'm living in the Great Plains area. So I'm living in less, the least collectivistic uh, areas uh, in the 
United States. Mississippi, I forget about Mississippi. That's part of the Old South. Individualism varies as a function of social class. Specifically, people from higher socioeconomic backgrounds tend to have more independent cells than those from poorer backgrounds within the same country. Wealthier Icelandic children tend to describe themselves more in terms of inner psychological traits than poorer Icelandic children do. Middle class American parents emphasize the importance of self direction to their children, whereas working class American parents place greater value on conforming to authority figures. And this is according to Weininger and Leroux in 2009. Interdependent messages are a uh, better fit with American students from working class backgrounds. Some of the highest concentrations of universities in the United States are in the Northeast and the Midwest where individualism is more pronounced. Psychological research within the United States has been largely conducted with participants who are even more individualistic than most other Americans. And I can tell you that uh, I'm from Indiana. As I said, I went to a small college in Indiana uh, there were how many? 14 uh, small colleges in Indiana and five major colleges. And now, of course, there's more than that. Um, there are more colleges than that. Um, uh, okay, I'm not going to try to name all the colleges in Indiana. <laughs> but Ohio's the same way. Pennsylvania has, has large numbers of colleges. Uh, we're not talking about community colleges at that time. Uh, when I was going to college, there were no community colleges, uh, not in Indiana anyway. Uh, so if we're talking about uh, Arizona, for example, uh, Arizona, I'm trying to think, they don't have any any colleges, small colleges, uh, that I can think of. Uh, Diné College, I guess, would be considered, uh, might would potentially be considered a, a small college uh, of about 1,000 to 2,000 students. Uh, like I said, there's there were 14 in Indiana. Almost every town had a uh, had a uh, small college in it. Uh, as interesting as that is, I was kind of the same way, but not not ex not as much as as Indiana, Ohio, uh, and Pennsylvania. Anyway. Other cultural dimensions uh, that researchers have investigated include uh, societal tightness uh, versus looseness. Uh, societal tightness characterizes how strong cultural norms are and how tolerant cultures are of deviant behavior. This predicts level of prevention, focus, impulse control, and self-regulation. Another cultural dimension that has been investigated are cultural values. Value, values for universalism, benevolence, conformity, tradition, security, power, achievement, Hedonism, which is uh, uh, doing things that, may, that uh, make you happy rather than, than working, um, stimulation and self-direction. Other cultural dimensions that have been investigated, power distance, uncertainty, avoidance, uh, vertical, horizontal social structure, relationship structure, context dependence, social cynicism, and complexity. One of the difficulties in studying cultural psychology is that individuals tend to be varied and complex. Cultures are highly variable and are resistant to categorization. All cultures are highly heterogeneous and contain a great variety of people. Cultural differences this book describes reflect general patterns of differences and not all-or-nothing statements. Uh, so as when, when we're dealing with uh, cultural psychology, we're not really dealing with any absolutes. A number of researchers have identified women as more interdependent than men. The features of independent uh, entities seem more characteristic of men than of women. There are issues of gender equality in most cultures. Women represent only about 3% of elected officials in Arab nations. Women represent 45% of the Swedish parliament. In Brazil, 50% of the men and women are literate. In Pakistan, twice as many men are literate as women. 
In the Netherlands, Germany, and Finland, on the average, people express views that men and women should be treated quite similarly. In India, Pakistan, and Nigeria, people tended to believe that roles, obligations, and rights of men and women are clearly different, with men being perceived to have more rights than women. Within a culture, men and women tended to share fairly similar views about gender equality. In India, Pakistan, and Nigeria, women tended to embrace the gender attitudes of their respective countries. It was really kind of interesting. Uh, we, my wife and I worked as uh, <clears throat> poll workers uh, on Tuesday. We had our primary in Iowa. And it was uh, kind of interesting. There were older women there and a one younger woman. I'm trying to think. Uh, and I'm pretending that we're, we're young, even though we're in our 70s. These women were in their 80s. And it was really kind of curious because their attitudes were a lot more interdependent than, than ours or the younger woman's attitudes. They acted like women's role was to be subordinate to males um, they're, from what they were saying. I, and, of course, I had a long conversation with one of them, uh, but the other two were, uh, the other two older women were, were kind of the same. They acted like men should always be in charge. In every case except two reversals in Malaysia and Pakistan, males have a significantly more traditional gender view than females, probably because traditional gender views benefit men more than women. And this is a Van Heusen advertisement from the 1950s, and as you can see, she's on her knees serving her husband breakfast in bed because it's a, Man Heusen's, a Van Heusen man's world. Uh, Van Heusen ties. Show her it's a man's world, it says. And there she is in her, in her night clothes, on her knees, serving him breakfast in bed. Probably something that wouldn't go in today's society, I'm, I'm hoping. Countries in which a large percentage of the population practiced Christianity, in particular Protestantism, were more likely to have egalitarian gender views whereas countries with a large percentage of Muslims were associated with more traditional gender views. Oddly, more northern countries express more egalitarian views, and more southern countries express more traditional gender views. The more urbanized the country, the more likely the country will have egalitarian views. A country's individualism score correlated positively with egalitarian views. One way to look at gender and culture is to determine which gender identity is views, viewed to be more essentialized, which gender is thought to reflect an underlying unchangeable essence, that which gender has uh, less flexible ways of being expressed in a socially approved way. Americans tend to view male gender identity to be more essentialized than female gender identity. Most Americans do not seem to find it disturbing or unusual for women to present themselves like men by wearing pants, having short hair, and not wearing facial makeup, or participating in stereotypical male behaviors, girls playing with trucks or girls playing ice hockey. But this, this man in a, a nightdress with his beard and his uh, oven mitts, this looks really weird. He's got a pearl, pearl, kind of a pearl necklace, and you can tell that he's just messing around. He doesn't really wear these clothes very often. Uh, it was kind of interesting. I was feeling a little strange today because I'm wearing white shorts, and they have little pineapples on them, and they look a little... And I, was, I said to my wife, uh, <laughs> I'm not sure I should have worn these shorts, and she said, it's okay. You just look a little... Uh, what was the word she used? Um, uh, what? Fruity. Fruity, that's right. She looked a little fruity. And of course, which in, in a way means uh, I looked like a homosexual, I guess. Uh, but uh, they, they're not the most masculine shorts in the world. I did feel a little odd wearing them <clears throat> with my l light, green, light yellow shirt on. I, uh, I guess I looked a little fruitier than some of the guys coming in. Uh, from the uh, 
from the farms. Anyway, it was really kind of an interesting conversation. <laughs> and there we go. There's. Does it look more natural for that lady to be playing hockey or for the man to be wearing a dress? Uh, it's, it's a floor-length dress. It's got on sh uh, flats, I guess. Those are flats. Anyway, which looks which looks more natural? Would anybody really complain about the lady uh, in uh, in hockey gear, or the, would they complain about the man or walking around in a dress? Many Americans do find it disturbing or unusual for men to represent themselves as women, wearing dresses, high heels, or lipstick, or to participate in stereotypical female behaviors, playing with dolls or taking ballet lessons. Male identity is less changeable and thus more essentialized. Male identity is less changeable and thus more essentialized. But other countries are different. In Hindu myths, more, many more male gods change into female goddesses than female goddesses change into gods. The Hindu religion involves goddess worship, and many of the most powerful gods are female, such as Kali, Parvati, Durga, and Maya. According to the Hindu religion, female identity is viewed as pure, strong, and powerful. In India, the male gender identity was more mutable and less essentialized than the female gender. This is uh, what Kali looked like. As you can see, she has eight arms. Uh, the tiger is her, is her spirit uh, animal. There's Parvati. She has four arms, and her spirit animal is the elephant. And there's Durga. She has eight arms as well, and she's the warrior goddess, and her spirit animal is the lion. And there's Maya. Her spirit animal is a bird. Oh, it's, a, it's an elephant, too. She's got four arms as well. Festinger in 1957 proposed that people have a powerful motivation to be consistent and their cognitive dissonance is the distressing feeling we have when we observe ourselves acting inconsistently to the way that we believe. The belief that we can easily change and are expected to change is referred to as an incremental theory of self. Traits are malleable and can be improved. Aspects of the self are largely resistant to change, which is known as an entity theory of self. Individuals with this view see their attributes to be largely inborn, or in other words, written in stone. And of course, here's two different children. One is saying, uh, this is me, this block of stone. This is what my intelligence is. I'll always be this smart. And this one says, no intelligence will grow and develop. And so that's two different ways of looking at things. Research found that 60% of the Chinese high school students said that the key to success in math is to study hard. In contrast, less than 25% of American high school students felt this way. And that may be one of the reasons why a lot of American students try to uh, skip around uh, their math classes. They don't want to they don't want to really take a lot of math classes. Japanese believe uh, more than Americans that intelligence is based on their on hard uh, how hard you try rather than on what they are born with. To get into a good American university, you typically need to get an acceptable score on the SAT. The SAT was originally designed to measure innate aptitudes and not efforts in one's classes. It turns out that studying hard can increase one's SAT score significantly. This has been a source of frustration for test makers, psychometricians, because the tests are no longer serving the function that they were originally designed for, which has sparked much policy debate about their ability or their utility or what you need, what you should be using the SAT for. A lot of colleges have, um, have discarded the SAT. Uh, so uh, you are accepted in college by how how high your your high school grades are, not by your SAT scores. 
Now, the one thing that SAT scores did in the past was that if you kind of sloughed off in high school, uh, then you could, uh, and you had a high SAT score, then you could still get into a, a pretty good school. But now schools aren't accepting them more because you can study and you can get a high SAT score. There is a specific um, uh, testing method that you can adhere to that, uh, that will give you a higher score if you, if you think in, in these terms, in these SAT uh, uh, forms. IQ tests are regularly given in public schools in the United States, and the results influence decisions on whether students should attend gifted or remedial classes. I was talking to my brother the other day, and he was saying that he didn't really learn to read until he was in the third grade. And the reason is because they were teaching whole word, the whole word method, and it just didn't make any sense to him. Uh, and they didn't start teaching phonics until he was in the third grade. Well, by that time, my, my sister was in the first grade. But they didn't teach her phonics until the second grade. So she missed out on a whole year of reading. And to this day, uh, she doesn't like to read. And the reason she doesn't like to read is because she has a hard time sounding out words because she didn't learn the phonics method uh, in the first grade. Now the truth is that I learned the I, I learned by I learned the sight method, <clears throat> and I only use the phonics method when when I'm reading um, medicines or something that that don't really make a whole lot of sense the way they're put together. But I can read relatively fast, and the reason I can read relatively fast is because I'm a, I I, I uh, recognize the word as I'm going along. <clears throat> Now, sometimes when I look at a word, <laughs> I'll see it as something else. And, and you'll hear me kind of bouncing around or juggling a, a word every once in a while. But mostly it's, uh, it's that uh, I do a lot of reading and I recognize words. I can't spell, but I can recognize words. I can, I can tell when you misspell a word, but I can't tell when I misspell a word, as weird as that may seem. In Japan, uh, to get into a good university, you need to do well on university entrance exams that test your mastery of a large amount of material. And if you don't make it, that is reason to become depressed. The Japanese bar exam to become a lawyer is notoriously difficult. Only 2.5% of the people pass in every year, and those who do, on average, have failed the exam four times before ultimately succeeding. Approximately two-thirds of those taking the American bar exam each year pass it, with about three-quarters of them passing, uh, passing it on their first attempt. The five-factor model of personality started as a personality profile test developed to test U.S. Air Force officers in the 1950s, and it was developed by Tupies and Crystal. They, they first published in 1961. They worked for the RAND Corporation, and they developed this, uh, this five-factor model. They found that uh, to be a good um, Air Force officer, and Air Force officers are not the same as naval officers or, or Army officers or Marine officers because the uh, naval, uh, Navy, Marine, and Army officers mostly work with other individuals. Army, uh, Air Force officers very often uh, work alone. In other words, they, be, they are pilots. Or they're navigators, so they uh, they work with airplanes. Uh, so their the need in the air force was completely different than it was in the army. The air force was part of the army until 1948, and in 1948 it became a separate branch of the service, because mainly because the air force was so much different. The army air force was so much different than the United States Army. Uh, so they decided that they needed to create their own branch of the service. And, of course, Tupies and, and Crystal were the individuals that were given the task of coming up with a personality profile test that fit uh, Air Force officers. Uh, they, you, they couldn't give it to Army officers or, or, or uh, Navy officers or Marine officers because their 
mission was completely different. Okay, so then they published in 1961. It was an Air Force uh, publication. It was a military publication, DOD publication, and it didn't get wide circulation. Two Peas and Crystal used uh, factor analysis to determine which of the, the of Cattell's 16 personality factors were significant. Uh, they came up with five that factored as most important over and over again. And these are Cattell's 16 uh, personality uh, uh, characteristics. Warmth, reasonings, uh, emotional stability, dominance, liveliness, rural consciousness, social boldness, sensitivity, vigilance, abstractedness, uh, privateness, apprehension, openness to change, self-reliance, perfectionism, and tension. Uh, so the five-factor model takes five of these, and these are the five factors. Openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism were the five that kept coming up in the five-factor model. Uh, so Tupis and Crystal, that's what they discovered. Uh, so they were able to uh, find good Air Force officers by giving them the, the uh, five-factor model personality profile test. Um, okay, so why openness? Openness to experience reflects a person's intelligence and curiosity about the world. And of course, if you want to be an Air Force officer, openness is very important. Conscientiousness indicates how responsible and dependable an individual is. Very important for any uh, military officer to be conscientious. Uh, extroversion uh, indicates how much an individual is active and dominant. Uh, so extroversion was uh, important as far as flying an airplane is concerned. You don't want uh, to, to you, you need to decide to either accelerate or decelerate or or look for the enemy or whatever. Anyway, this was very important as far as being an Air Force pilot was concerned. Uh, agreeableness is the extent to which a person tends to be warm and pleasant. So the agreeableness was a uh, part of their um, uh, personality makeup. And neuroticism is the degree to which an individual can be seen as emotionally stable and unpredictable. In other words, the, the less neurotic you were, the more likely you would be make a good officer. The five-factor model proposes that all personality traits largely reflect some combination of these five core traits. All personality traits should show significant correlations with at least one, if not more, of these core traits. So he, he thought that Cattell's uh, 16 uh, uh, factor model uh, was too big. It was, uh, it was too uh, nebulous. It was too uh, all-encompassing. And we, they needed uh, these five specific uh, personality traits uh, to be a good military, to be a, be a good Air Force officer. The five factors uh, can be seen to reflect the basic structure of personality. And that's what we have determined uh, over the years since 1961, uh, that we've determined that these six factors or five factors are the most important of the, of the 16 factors. <clears throat> There's a question as to how well the five factor structure generalizes elsewhere. And we're going to talk about that in just a second. This is maybe true in the United States and especially true in the United States military. An analysis of indigenous Chinese personality trait terms found a set of factors that were not the same as the big five. Uh, rather, four factors emerged that were captured by the following labor, labels. So in China, where it's a collectivist country, uh, where they are more in, interdependent than in the United States, uh, they didn't have the big five, they had the big four. And these are the four that they came up with. Dependability, reflecting responsibility, optimism, and trustworthiness. Dependable because, well, it's a collectivist country and everybody has to depend on everybody else. Interpersonal relatedness, reflecting harmony, thrift, relational orientation and tradition. And of course, if you're dealing with a collectivistic interdependent population, interpersonal relatedness is very important. Uh, social potency, reflecting leadership, adventurousness, and extroversion. And of course, social potency is not something that you would want in a collectivistic or uh, uh, interdependent uh, uh, relate, um, uh, 
social situation. Individualism reflecting logical orientation, defensiveness, and so self-orientation. And of course, this is a negative. Individualism is a negative, as is social potency, as far as the Chinese were concerned. Similar approaches have been taken in other cultures. Researchers looking at Filipino personality traits discovered two additional traits to the big five, temper tri temperamentalness and a negative valence dimension. This is really kind of interesting because in the Philippines, which is, uh, the Philippines are actually an Asian country, but uh, they were occupied by the United States uh, from the uh, Spanish-American War uh, at the turn of the 20th century until 1944. Uh, so the Philippines have a, you know, despite the fact that they were occupied by the United States, they have the big five, but they also have two more. And the temperamentalness is really kind of interesting because tem and the negative valence dimension. Uh, the temperamentalness is acting like, uh, I can't, shouldn't really mention Donald Trump again, uh, but uh, uh, temperamentalness is uh, a leadership quality uh, where you are, setting yourself above and and uh, beyond everybody that you're that you're dealing with and the negative valence is you getting out uh, angry at those people and forcing them to do what you want by by acting angry that's the negative valence dimension now this is these two factors are very strong in the philippines which is an asian country but was uh, occupied by the United States, and this is how they they run things. And this may be one of the reasons why, uh, when when we're talking about democracy in the United States, and we look at the Philippines, uh, one of the things that we are want them to do is to have leaders like us. Uh, and our leaders, of course, are American leaders, and American leaders had the Big Five, uh, but uh, the uh, in. Uh, of the Philippines, in order to be a leader, you need to be temperamental and you need to use anger as a way to get people to do what you want, as curious as that is. And if we look at, at some of the uh, Filipino uh, leaders, um, Marcos uh, and Duarte, uh, Duarte's in, in charge now, uh, Aquino, they had Aquino, was a female. Um, uh, she lost an election to Duarte because Duarte was such a, uh, a macho guy. Uh, and uh, he started executing drug dealers um, on the streets. And, of course, we were appalled by this, but uh, in the Philippines he was very popular. Uh, temperamentalness and negative uh, valence uh, dimension, which is using anger to get people to do what you want. In an investigation of 11 different language groups in South Africa revealed nine underlying factors, some of which overlapped with the Big Five, but the other factors that did not, uh, integrity and relationship harmony. And of course, uh, South Africa has a large uh, uh, indigenous population um, where they, they were... Uh, uh, conflictual before before uh, Europeans got there. Some studies in other languages reveal evidence for factors in addition to the Big Five. Other studies sometimes do not find evidence for all five of the Big Five traits. In particular, openness to experience is the trait that emerges the least consistently in studies conducted in other languages. And this may be because, well, so where did we, where did they, we come up with the Big Five? Uh, the Big Five uh, personality model. We came up with that in the United States. Now, who are, who are the people in the United States? Well, the dominant population is white, and that whole population are immigrants. Uh, not only are they immigrants, but they are immigrants from a lot of different places. So in order for people to move out of Europe and to come all the way to the United States for a new life, they needed to be open to experience. So open to experience makes a lot of sense if you're living in the United States or you're living in Australia or you're living in Canada because those individuals had to had to leave their 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 uh, homes in order to create a new life in the new world in their new world anyway 
Uh, so South Americans, uh, North Americans, Australians, of course they would have a more openness to experience because their ancestors, or them, they had to leave their home country and come uh, to a new world in order to... Uh, and, and, and so they were more open to experience. So if you go, this is a flag of Romania. So if you go to Romania, you know, those people have, have lived in that area for dozens of generations. Are they open to experience? Well, they don't travel. They're happy to, to have lived the same place that their grandparents and great-grandparents and great-great-grandparents and great-great-great-grandparents lived. So are they open to experience? Probably not so much so much. So that's that may be one of the reasons why Europeans have different, uh, do not have openness to experience as one of their personality traits. The North Central Great Plains, especially around Minnesota and Wisconsin, is the epicenter for friendly and conventional cluster, as re residents of are the highest in the country for traits of extroversion, agreeableness, and conscientiousness. Uh, so this is green area on this map. I know that's Potter Electric Company, but <laughs> but this area on the map are the friendliest people. Minnesota, Wisconsin, uh, this area right here. They're not quite in the Rust Belt. Here's the Rust Belt. Rust Belt is Michigan, Indiana, Illinois, and Ohio. That's that's pretty much the Rust Belt. Kind of wanders into Pennsylvania and and Western New York as well. Uh, the western states from Oregon down to Arizona house the relaxed and creative cluster where there is the lowest neuroticism and the highest openness to experience. And that may be because not only did they come to the New World, but they traveled all the way across the New World to the West. So I guess they are more a little bit more open uh, to experience than people that, that uh, started over here and ended up here like my family did. The northeastern states, especially New York and Massachusetts, are home to the temperamental and uninhibited uh, cluster, where people score the highest in, on neuroticism and the lowest in conscientiousness. And if you've ever visited that area, not the friendliest people in the world. Go to Wisconsin. If you want friendly people, go to Wisconsin and Minnesota. Minnesota. And that's the end of that chapter, but we need to tackle the next chapter as well. Chapter 7. Uh, this one's about living in, in multicultural worlds, kind of a fascinating chapter. Of course, I find them all fascinating. Acculturation is the process by which people migrate to, to and learn a culture that is different from their original or heritage culture. Uh, so what's one of the reasons that uh, they open the boarding schools? They are trying to teach uh, the uh, indigenous uh, people in the, in the Americas or the, in the United States uh, to become... Uh, American citizens rather than uh, their tribal citizens. That was their what they were doing. And the reason I have this picture is because this young gentleman's wearing sunglasses, uh, and that's a form of a, uh, of a acculturation. I'm sure sunglasses weren't part of his cultural heritage, since he looks like these are people from the Amazon. Amazon Valley. Moving to a new culture involves psychological adjustment. Uh, this adjustment occurs over a wide variety of domains, acquiring a new language, learning new interpersonal and social behaviors, becoming accustomed to new values, becoming a member of a minority group, adjusting one's self-concept. And for some people, the hardest part is becoming a member of a minority group. Because where they've lived before, they have been part of the dominant group. And when they move, and they move to, uh, and they move to an area where people are different than them, now suddenly they are a minority. Now this is, I'm, I'm used to this. Uh, one of the reasons I'm used to this is because when I grew up, everybody went to church except my family didn't go to church. There were other people that didn't go to church, but you, you're never sure who they are. <laughs> <laughs> you just know that all the all the kids that go to church hang around together, and they talk to each other. Uh, I say uh, I was telling you about the uh, about uh, working at the uh, 
uh, polling place on Tuesday. It was really kind of interesting. This one lady is a big churchgoer, and everybody that came in from her church, she had to hug and greet and, and whatnot. And I just thought that was, was really kind of interesting. This lady's hugging all these people. <clears throat> Uh, Lysgaard in 1955 tracked a number of Norwegian Fulbright scholars in the United States. In the first few months of their experiences, the migrants were having an especially positive time in their visit. Uh, they were enjoying the experiences, meeting new people, trying new foods, communicating with, uh, with people in a foreign language, and feeling the excitement of participating in a novel and exotic environment. Now, one of the things that you probably don't know about Norwegians uh, Norway is is uh, uh, is way far north, uh, and they eat a lot of fish. Uh, my wife uh, visited Norway when she was we were stationed in Germany, and she was telling me about eating fish for breakfast, um, something that you know you would never probably never do in the United States. They do it in in England sometimes. They'll have kippers. Uh, for breakfast, which is, I'm not exactly sure what kippers are. I don't fit, eat fish at all. But I can imagine, you know, it's somebody bringing in a big platter of fish for breakfast. Uh, platter of eggs, you know, okay, that sounds good. Platter of pancakes, that sounds good. Uh, Belgian waffles, you know, uh, lots of things for breakfast. Fish is not one of them that I would ever think about. Uh, I was reading, uh, what was I reading? Uh, Left-handed Old Man, Son of Old Man Hat, the book. Uh, was really kind of interesting because he seemed to have mutton for breakfast just about every day. Sometimes they had uh, blue corn mush, uh, but uh, a lot of leftover mutton from the, the, the night before. And they boiled their mutton. He just kept talking about boiling mutton, and I... I don't know, boiled meat doesn't sound good to me anyway, and I don't can't eat mutton, so that's kind of curious to me. It's, uh, breakfasts around the world are kind of curious. Um, when I was traveling in South America, in, in uh, Peru, uh, they had um, continental breakfast, which is, is rolls. It's, bre it's a bread. Uh, so you'd eat bread for breakfast. You know, that's what a continental breakfast primarily is. Um, but, um, you know, it, it all depends on where you are and what food they have available for you as to what you eat for breakfast, I guess. Oberg in 1960 referred to the first few months as the honeymoon stage. Everything's going great. You're learning a new language. You're, you're learning new customs. You're seeing new sights. It is the existence of the honeymoon stage that keeps the tourism trade in business, as you can imagine, how long do people, when they uh, vacation, uh, they go to, to France, uh, how long do they spend in France? Well, two, or th two, two months, maybe, a, or two weeks, maybe a month, uh, maybe just four or five days. Sure, they're still in the honeymoon phase. Everything's brand new. Everything's exciting. Uh, so, of course, that's why uh, it's easy uh, for people to be tourists because they're not really becoming... Uh, imbued with the with the culture, they're seeing the culture and they're seeing it as something novel. Most travelers do not stay in a new culture long enough to move past this stage, and they thus tend to view their experiences in new cultures to be, uh, for the most part, pleasant and exciting. No matter what it is, uh, if you're just visiting someplace, California seems like so much fun. There's so much to do, uh, but if you're you've been there for more than uh, two or three months, uh, uh, there's not, it's awfully crowded and it's not that much fun. How many times can you go to Disneyland? Uh, do you have enough money to go to Disneyland every day? And pretty soon you've seen everything and ridden all the rides anyway. Uh, following the honeymoon stage, most visitors turn a corner and begin to have increasingly negative views about their host culture. And Lysgaard found this out in 1955 as well. Between six and 18 month visitors experienced the most negative feelings of their sojourn in a stage that has been labeled the crisis or culture shock stage. Now, this is really kind of interesting because we were stationed in Germany for three years. And I can tell you after about, I don't know, it's, it, it hits about three or four months. Uh, you, you know, you, you, st you go through the, the first changing of the seasons, and you're you're going. You know, this isn't this is 
kind of fun, but in the wintertime, you can't do anything. You have to stay in the house, and the houses aren't that big, and uh, Germans don't like to, uh, to heat the whole house. They only want to heat the kitchen, which means everybody's sitting around the dinner table pretty much for the whole day. Uh, that's about it. In the culture shock stage, the thrill of having novel and exotic experiences wears off, and these experiences become tiring and difficult. At this stage, recent migrants often realize their language skills are not yet good enough for them to fully function in the new environment. They can have uh, conversations with somebody if that somebody is patient enough to interact with them when they don't have very good language skills. During the culture shock stage, the migrant realizes that they do not have a rich enough understanding of how the system works to thrive. The people they initially met who were interested in them because they were exotic and different are no longer so interested in those differences. So all of a sudden, they become a anchor, they become a dead weight uh, to groups. Recent migrants may also be discovering that the television programs just aren't as interesting as the ones they used to see in their home country, and they start to miss their favorite foods. This is the time that homesickness can become very strong. And of course, this is the time when uh, if you are in the military, you live on base, um, you, you, don't go, you start not go, going off base. You just stay on base. You can have your own food because you've got the commissary right there. Um, uh, homesickness does uh, it is there, uh, it, and but of course you can watch American television on uh, on AFN, American F Armed Forces Network. <clears throat> you only get one choice, but it, at least it's American, uh, and they're speaking English. If you're watching uh, Japanese channels, uh, you, you just never know what you're looking at. Uh, you can't understand what they're talking about. Uh, I'm thinking of, of, of more of uh, Japan than Germany. Anyway, hope sick, you get homesick. Uh, culture shock is the feeling of being anxious, helpless, irritable, and in general homesick that one experiences after moving to a new culture. The symptoms of culture shock includes missing your close friends and family, missing the little things about being back home like conversations with bus drivers, eating your favorite snack food, which they don't have in this country. Real shocking. Uh, you go to a, um, a corner store in Japan and you're looking for snack food. You never know if there's going to be any sugar in it because the Japanese don't eat a lot of sugar. Their snacks don't really have that much sugar in them, uh, if they have any at all. Uh, a lot of fishy stuff, uh, dried squid and whatnot. A sojourner in, in uh, culture shock may wallow in the crisis stage for several months and then start to adjust and begin to enjoy their experiences more. Their language abilities improve, enabling them to function better in their daily lives. Eventually, sojourners become better able to make enduring friendships with the locals, and they adapt to the things in the new culture, such as the TV programming and the food, so that these no longer felt strange. They have started thinking more and more like the locals around them. This stage, labeled the adjustment phase, tends to extend over a number of years. People become more and more proficient at functioning in their new culture. And, of course, that's what usually happens to people in the military if they've been there for a couple of years, uh, especially Germany. The Germans, um, they like Americans because we had a lot of money. <laughs> Because we had money. Um, but uh, people start drinking German beer and going to the guest houses. And they start understanding what, the, what everybody's talking about. And, and uh, Germans are, are different than Americans. Uh, Americans tend to um, get a little bit more violent when they get drunk. But Germans just get sleepy. So it's really, uh, you go to a guest house, uh, a tavern uh, in Germany, and everybody's just kind of laughing and, and joking around, and somebody's taking a nap in the corner, you know, and it's, uh, it's kind of a pleasant situation, a lot more pleasant than in the United States. There's always an opportunity, there's always a possibility that a fight's going to break out in the United States, but not so much in Germany. 
And of course, these people, there you go, he's adapted. He's painted himself and he's got his bamboo spear. And there you go. He looks like everybody else. And there she is. This is this is the American here. These are African women. It wasn't quite comfortable enough to uh, to take her brassiere off, I guess. But uh, she painted herself nice and red so that she looks like everybody else, I guess. She has the same hairdo this lady has. Now the next picture is a little bit different. Okay, this lady, I'm not really sure. Uh, there's somebody that's really mad at her. This guy's not real happy with her. This is uh, what they call a, a headrest, and this is this is their pillow. Uh, this is in Somalia, in some some area in Somalia. Anyway, so she thought that she could, since everybody, all the women, weren't wearing any dresses or any tops, that she would walk around without a top. Of course, I'm not sure these guys agree with her that this is appropriate, but uh, there you go. And she has her gift. This is the the uh, the headrest. Wait a minute. There's somebody down here that doesn't look real happy. This guy's laughing. <laughs> yeah, everybody's looking at her. She's awfully pale. Sojourners may go through the, the same adjustment stages uh, when they return home. Initially, people are elated to see their families and friends again and to be able to eat their favorite foods. It is not uncommon for people to soon experience reverse culture shock and find themselves puzzling over why they did not quite feel at home anymore and why they feel somewhat alienated from those around them. They don't feel like they are a good fit anymore. Uh, and a lot of this happens a lot. Uh, this happened uh, when we came back from Germany. Uh, this happened when we came back from Japan. This happened to me when I moved back to Iowa from, uh, from, from the uh, Navajo Nation. Um, I, it was weird. I, 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 I just didn't feel right. It didn't feel right because the people were different and the people acted different. And the, um, I was used to being uh, an oddity. And here all of a sudden I was the same as everybody else. Uh, the people looked different. The, uh, everybody was taller. Uh, there's a lot of tall people in this area. Anyway, I just didn't feel right. It just felt funny. I was happy to be home with my wife, uh, you know, loving uh, ha being around my grandson and my daughter again, but it just didn't feel right. Japan is a country that is relatively ethnically homogenous. 98% of the people living in Japan are ethnic Japanese. And if you're in Japan, everybody, no, saying everybody looks the same, that's not really right, but everybody looks Japanese. Of course, all, not all Japanese look the same. That would be silly. Uh, just like saying all Navajos look the same. That would be silly. Uh, regardless of how well people learn uh, the customs or master the language, they will always stand out as different from the other 98% who are ethnically Japanese. Uh, and there is a name for you. And it really doesn't matter whether you're, you're Caucasian, you're, uh, you're indigenous, uh, you're... Uh, African American doesn't really matter who you are or what you are as long as you're not Japanese then they see you as gaijin gaijin means an alien uh, almost like an alien from outer space but remember the Japanese were an isolated island uh, that wouldn't allow anybody else to to uh, to, to uh, be there except ethnically Japanese until the 1840s so they've only been an open country for uh, about 180 years. Uh, that's not very long. And of course, the Japanese don't, if they intermarry, they, that, they don't bring the person to Japan. They, the, the individual moves away from Japan if they're going to be around, uh, if they're going to live with their, their foreign spouse. Xiao and Ying in 1995 tracked the acculturation experiences of a few hundred migrants to Japan, but didn't find the pattern that Lisgard had seen in 1955. Instead of a U-shaped curve where things start out great, get worse, and then recover, the researchers discovered a rather pessimistic 
L-shaped curve where things stay bad. And if you've ever talked to anybody who's lived in Japan for an extended length of time, they're going to tell you this is the way it is. At first, everything was kind of exciting. Then, uh, and then the, the negativity started uh, creeping in and I became homesick and I just didn't get any better. I lived here for five years. I learned Japanese. I had Japanese friends, but it's like they didn't trust me or something. It just, they didn't, didn't get very much better. Salon Ying in 1995 discovered that people who had been in Japan for five years were just as negative toward Japan as those who had been there for uh, just over a year. They all seemed in the depths of the crisis stage. The author speculates that the adjustment phase starts somewhere after five years, but before the 10-year point. So if you got to be in Japan, expect to feel like an alien for an extended length of time. Cultural distance is the difference between culture, uh, cultures and their overall ways of life. We can uh, hypothesize that the more cultural distance someone needs to travel, the more difficulty that person will have acculturating. And here you have all these men standing around wearing turbans, and you can imagine how he feels. They've all got swords, they've all got staffs, uh, they're all armed, and of course he's not. He's got his bottle of water. He doesn't have a... these are all Sikhs. Uh, he doesn't have a turban on. You can imagine how long it would make him feel. It, it would take him to feel like he was one of this group. There are various measures that can be issue, uh, used to determine acculturation across cultures. One indirect measure is language performance. Uh, several studies show that the best predictors of acculturative success is language ability, and this is according to Gullahorn and Gullahorn in 1963, and Ying and Lisi in 1991. Uh, so, uh, how do you how do you uh, get out of that funk? Uh, you you uh, start studying the language and start uh, you, and and your ability to speak becomes better. Knowles and colleagues in 1996 speculated that the greater the confidence and the mastery of the host country's language, the greater the identity with the culture. Many researchers have found a connection between language skill and success acculturating. When foreign students seek entry into the United States uh, universities, they are uh, required to take the TOEFL, the test of English as a foreign language. Research shows that individuals who came from countries that are similar to English, the Dutch and the German, uh, perform better than those who grew up speaking other European languages that are a little more distance, uh, distant. And these are the Romance languages. So if you had, if you spoke a Germanic language like they speak in Germany and they speak in, in, uh, in Holland, um, then you, uh, it's e a little bit easier for you to, uh, to uh, uh, learn English. Uh, so you, you tend to, to do a little bit better uh, than uh, people that come from France or Spain or Italy, uh, which are all Romance languages. So the Germans and the Dutch. And the reason this lady's got on orange is because that is the color of the Dutch uh, soccer team is orange. They are the orange men. And, of course, she's, she must be German because she has on a, a Germany shirt. Um, and and you, you might ask yourself, well, I th English isn't German. Well, no, but it's Anglo-Saxon. Anglo-Saxon Anglo stands for the Angles and the Saxons, and they were two Germanic tribes that, uh, that uh, came to England, and they became the dominant languages, Anglo, Ang the Angle language, language and the Saxon language, and they're both Germanic languages. So, yes, German, uh, English is a Germanic language, a more Germanic language than it is a Romance language. We do have, uh, of course, the, uh, the uh, English were conquered by the French in 1066, uh, and they brought French to the, to the, uh, to the area. Uh, and some of the English words are, have a French de a derivation. Some have a, 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 a Scandinavian derivation because of the, uh, the Scandinavians 
Uh, I just read an article that told me not to call them Vikings anymore, <laughs> but the Vikings were there as well. So a lot of it is Scandinavian. A lot of most of it is German. Uh, there are there's a lot of Latin and uh, and French in the English language as well. According to the Education Testing Service, which administers the TOEFL, uh, speakers of Indo-European languages tend to, to perform better on the TOEFL than those who speak languages from highly distant language groups, such as Kazakh or Japanese. So the Japanese and, Kazakh, and people from Kazakhstan, and these are people from Kazakhstan. This is what Kazakhs look like. Well, it's what they're... They look like if they're that old, I guess. Cultural distance encapsulates more than just language. Many other skills must be mastered when people move to a new culture. Ward and Kennedy in 1995 compared the adjustment of Malaysian university students in New Zealand, a culture that is quite different from their own despite the, the not-so-distant proximity, and a group of Malaysian students in Singapore, which has a similar culture. Now this is Singapore. Where is Singapore? Oh, Singapore's right here. Singapore is this little place right here. Now Singapore is actually in Malaysia, and Indonesia is right here. Here's the Philippines. This is Australia, and this is New Zealand. As you can see, it's not that far away. It's not that far away. Malaysia is not that far away from from New Zealand or from Singapore. So why in the world would they have a difficult time in New Zealand? Well, the difference is the culture. Uh, the Singapore, uh, in Singapore, the uh, culture is closer to Malaysia than it is in New Zealand, which is more of a, a European uh, uh, English um, uh, culture. The students completed a measure of cultural adjustment that assessed their ability, uh, their daily problems in navigating through the new culture. After spending almost three years in the two countries, the Malaysian students who were studying in Singapore reported having fewer difficulties than those who were studying in New Zealand. Sojourners from more distant cultures suffer from more distress, require more medical consultations, and have more social difficulties in general than those who traverse less cultural distances. And this is uh, according to Babaker et al. in 1980 and Furnham and Bachner in 1982. Some indigenous Canadian tribes, such as the Simshin of the Northwest Pacific Coast region, engaged in subsistence practices, primarily fishing for salmon and shellfish, that allowed them to accumulate large quantities of food and establish permanent, highly stratified settlements long before they had any contact with the Europeans. And this is the way they lived pre-Columbian. They, Because they were living on the shore and because... Uh, fish and uh, salmon and shellfish were plentiful. They were able to live in permanent settlements. This is where they carved the uh, totem poles. The Eastern Cree live uh, just below the tree line in northern Quebec. Uh, they engage in subsistence practices, hunting in the winter and fishing in the summer, which does not allow them to accumulate much food. So some of the bands are mi migratory and have low sociocultural stratification. And these are the Eastern Cree. Now, if you've ever been to Montana and you've been to uh, Rocky Boy, Rocky Boy is Chippewa Cree, and that's they are the same tribe. Uh, the Eastern Cree and the, and the uh, Chippewa Cree are the same tribe. Just in different areas of the country. The carrier or Atlas Atlas Shima or Athabasca or Athabascan speaking group. They live on the Rocky Mountain Plateau of northern British Columbia. They also engage in hunting and fishing like the Eastern Cree. But because they have the possibility of accumulating large numbers of salmon at the headwaters of some rivers, and because their culture was uh, influenced geographically close to the Simshin and the carrier represent a culture with a moderate degree of food accumulation and social stratification. Barry and Annis in 1974 speculated that the more stratified the culture, the more similar they were to the European culture, the easier it would be to acculturate 
to a European dominance. The Simshian acculturated the easiest, the Eastern Kree had the most stress in acculturating, and the carrier was were somewhere in between. Cultural fit is a degree to which an individual's personality is more similar to the dominant cultural values in the host culture. It would seem that the greater the cultural fit of a person with the host culture, the more easily he or she should acculturate to it. Let me go back to this. These are fancy dancers. If you've never been to a powwow, the fancy dancers. <laughs> and they're also Canadian. I, I wanted to make sure that I had pictures of Canadians. And this guy's a Canadian. Uh, I'm trying to think. I think he's a car not a carrier. He's a carry the kettle. Carry the kettle. <clears throat> Which is the same thing as uh, a Cinnaboyne in the United States. Same tribe. Uh, different country. So they, they have different names. Uh, people who score high on extroversion are more likely to move to other countries particularly to urban areas, when compared with those who are less extroverted. Some researchers have proposed that because extroversion should facilitate communication everywhere, extroverts should always fare better in the acculturation experience compared with introverts. But this isn't the way it works. The study in New Zealand found that Malaysians high on the extroversion scale showed more signs of well-being than those who scored low, because they acted more like people from New Zealand who were more extroverted. However, English-speaking expatriates in Singapore, who scored high on the extroversion scale, reported more depression, boredom, frustration, and health problems. In other words, in Singapore, the people are more introverted. And because he was extroverted, he was rejected more, or he felt rejected more, because he didn't act like the people that lived there. Extroversion does not always facilitate acculturation. It appears that an extroverted personality makes a better cultural fit in New Zealand than it does in Singapore, and extroverts will fare better in the acculturation experience only when they fit in well with other cultures. And I've seen this uh, with, with teachers uh, in different places. Uh, we had a, uh, I had a colleague uh, at, uh, at Diné College who didn't really fit in very well. And she kept saying, I fit in anywhere, I fit in anywhere. Well, the reality is that she was a lot more extroverted than most of the people are on the, on the reservation. And she really didn't get along with people very well because she kept trying to push people to do things because she's extroverted. Uh, you know, and that's, that's her mission in life is to force people to do things. Now, that would have worked off the reservation, but it really didn't work very well. Uh, on the reservation, and uh, uh, she eventually got frustrated and left. Highly extroverted immigrants fare better in terms of their well-being when they immigrate to countries with overall more pronounced levels of extroversion. People with more independent self-concepts have been found to suffer less distress and acculturating to the United States than people with more interdependent self-concepts. And people who have patterns of emotions that are more similar to those from the host culture report experiencing greater relational well-being. One acculturation strategy is that people need to participate in the larger society of their host culture. Are the people motivated to acquire an identity consistent with that of the, of the host culture? Are these people striving to maintain their own heritage culture and identity as members of that culture? Do people have positive attitudes toward their heritage culture? And are they actively seeking ways to preserve the traditions of their heritage culture? These are all really important questions. Who, do you, who are you and who do you want to be? That's, that's a huge question when we're talking about acculturation. Uh, so, I told you the story about when I joined the, the Air Force. Uh, when I joined the Air Force, my first two assignments were in Texas. I'm not a Texan. I am, I, I'm a Hoosier farm boy. Uh, and at that point, I needed to decide how I was going to, whether I was going to acculturate to the uh, society that uh, I had been uh, thrust into, or whether I was going to maintain my own culture, try to maintain my own culture as a Hoosier. 
<clears throat> I chose, and I did this consciously, I chose to try to be my own person, try to be my own, try to be a Hoosier farm boy. Uh, that's the person I am. That's who I wanted to be. And that's who I was in Texas. I was a little bit easier when I moved to Ohio. Actually, it wasn't that much easier when I moved to Ohio because, as it turns out, uh, we were living in uh, in and around Dayton, Ohio, which is, is urban. And I'm a ruralist. I've, I've lived in the country. I grew up in the country, and I've lived in the country all my life. Luckily, I married a woman that, that uh, my wife allows me to live in the country, so I feel comfortable here. And when we... Uh, every time we move, uh, we, we try to find some place that's out in the country where that's not so too crowded. Uh, I imagine if I had to live in the city, I'm trying to think of when I had to live in the city. Uh, we were even pretty much in the country in uh, Washington, D.C. Um, I guess the, the most urban that we lived was Northridge, California. That was pretty tough. Uh, but we lived out in the country. We lived in the, the city when we first moved to Montana. We lived in the town, but we, it wasn't really much of a city. Uh, but, uh, you know, I felt kind of claustrophobic living in Harlem, Montana. I felt much better when we moved out to a farm. Uh, anyway, so this is, these are all questions you have to ask yourself. Who am I and uh, do I want to try to change to be like the people that I'm living with. Uh, let me tell you a quick story. Um, I have a, I had a friend, or I could, I could say I have a friend. I actually saw him in, uh, during the 2020 election. Uh, but um, uh, he came from North Carolina. He still has a North Carolina accent. Uh, but when he moved to Texas, he started working at Texas A&M University. And when he moved to Texas, all of a sudden, he started wearing cowboy hats and wearing cowboy boots. And his attitude is more Texan now than it was than, than it is North Carolina. And uh, he was telling me that his brother gets mad at him because he doesn't like his cowboy boots. <laughs> Which, they, of course, he was, he's from the, the uh, North Carolina, uh, the Lake Hatter, or the... Uh, Cape Hatteras area, uh, and there they lived on the ocean. And here it is. Here, here he moved to Texas and became a Texan. Uh, so his attitudes are, are and his, the way his speech pattern is is still pretty close to uh, North Carolina. They have so soft vowels. Anyway, he changed. He changed, and he married a woman from from uh, from Texas, and now he's different. And his brother doesn't like it. Anyway, so there you go. Another strategy of acculturation involves attempts to fully participate in the host culture while at the same time striving to maintain the traditions of one's heritage culture. This is known as integration strategy. Uh, people using this strategy have positive views uh, towards uh, both their heritage and their host culture. They are seeking the best of both worlds. Now that's really difficult in Japan because the Japanese will not accept you unless you're Japanese. It just isn't going to work. You can dress dress like Japanese, you can put on makeup like the Japanese, but they're not going to accept you because it's a very closed society. The strategy that involves little or no effort to participate in the host culture or to maintain the traditions of the heritage culture is known as the marginalization strategy. People using this strategy have negative views toward both their heritage and their host cultures, this strategy may be something uh, pursued more by people who have grown up in a multicultures in multiple cultures across their childhood, and of course, this may be uh, what has happened with uh, select uh, immigrants uh, coming to the United States. Also, may have may have happened with uh, American Indians after going going to boarding schools. Marginalization. They didn't feel part of either culture, the dominant culture or the, uh, their, their native culture. Some individuals who have grown up in multiple cultures are sometimes termed as third culture kids. 
and thus will identify themselves as global citizens. Some researchers do not accept marginalization as a legitimate acculturation strategy, but as a form of neuroticism. In other words, you're acultural, and that just doesn't, nobody's acultural. It structures your brain, uh, it, it uh, uh, affects the way that you act, so that's just not something that people do. The assimilation strategy involves all, an attempt to fit in and fully participate in the host culture while making little or no effort to maintain the traditions of one's heritage culture. It involves having uh, positive attitudes toward the heritage culture. Uh, it reflects a desire to leave behind uh, the ancestral past so as to fit in with the host culture. And assimilation is what uh, was the goal of the boarding schools uh, for the uh, indigenous peoples in the, in the Americas. It was also the goal of the United States government with all the immigrants coming in at the turn of the 20th century. Uh, about 60% of all the immigrants that came to the United States came in between 1880 and 1920. That's a lot of people. Uh, and of course they needed to educate these people so the way they did that, or they needed to um, uh, indoctrinate all these individuals, so they did that by sending them to school and making them Ameri trying to make them Americans. They tried to force them to assimilate. And this is sometimes called the melting pot. Uh, didn't really work very well. Uh, most people still maintain uh, contact with their, their heritage culture. So assimilation was the goal but assimilation was not always the uh, outcome. And this may be one of the reasons why some people are hostile to the idea of American Indians living on reservations uh, because they want American is Indians to assimilate just like uh, all the immigrants did. Uh, the, you know, if forced assimilation, whatever. Uh, anyway, they, they, that's what they want. And, one party, of course, is more uh, in favor of this. The Republicans tend to, to favor this way of, of doing things. Rather, the Democrats are, are more multicultural uh, because, well, they encompass more people than just you know the, the white population in the United States. Uh, so they're a little bit more accepting of uh, people that aren't assimilated. The separation strategy involves efforts to maintain the traditions of the heritage culture while making little or no effort to participate in the host culture. This strategy is composed of positive attitudes toward the heritage culture and negative attitudes toward the host culture. People pursuing separation strategies do not wish to acculturate to the host culture. And of course we see this especially in the male population of uh, some of the people, uh, the immigrants coming to the United States. The most common strategy uh, people pursue is the integration strategy. The least common strategy is the marginalization strategy. A person will not strive to fit into the host culture if that culture shows a good deal of prejudice toward the individual's own cultural group. People who have physical features that distinguish them from the majority of the, those in their host culture will likely experience more prejudice than people who have physical features that allow them to blend in with their host culture. More physically uh, distinct ethnic groups are more likely to maintain negative attitudes uh, toward the host culture and pursue separation or marginalization strategies. Physically distinct ethnic groups are more likely to actively support collective efforts to benefit their groups social position. People who are of lower socioeconomic status or who are members of indigenous cultural groups are more likely to pursue separation or marginalization strategies because the host culture does not typically offer them much that they desire. The extent to which majority members of the host culture value cultural diversity and tolerance of cultural differences also predicts the amount of prejudice that immigrants experience. When host cultures promote tolerance for diversity and multiculturalism, migrants are more likely to adopt more positive attitudes toward the host culture, which increases the likelihood that they will pursue integration or assimilation strategies. 
The acculturation strategy, uh, strategy that one adopts might vary across situations. Turkish immigrants in the Netherlands often show an integration strategy in public situations where they act in the mainstream of Dutch ways, yet some will simultaneously show a separation strategy in private, dejecting mainstream Dutch ways when they are in an entirely Dutch or Turkish immigrant setting. And this is according to Arends Toff and Van de, Van de Veer. Uh, that's in 2003. And two of these individuals are Turkish. Uh, of these six women, uh, it's your choice to pick out which ones are Dutch and which ones are have Turkish ancestry. If you chose these two individuals as the individuals with Turkish ancestry, you are absolutely correct. As you can see, three of these people are blondes. And this one has light brown hair. Chestnut brown, I guess. The four acculturation strategies, assimilation, integration, separation, and marginalization, are hypothesized to yield different outcomes in the acculturation process. The strategy that is hypothesized to result the lowest degree of acculturative stress is the integration strategy, and much research shows that this strategy yields the most favorable outcomes. So what do we have to do? Uh, we have to allow people to maintain their cultures. That will get us the most positive results. Sometimes immigrants will adopt the fast food eating habits of Americans. Among immigrants who lived in the United States for less than a year, 8% were obese. Among those who had been here for 15 years, 19% were obese. This percentage approaches the obesity rate for American-born residents at 22%. When an immigrant or minority member does not fit the prototype of their host culture, people might question their identity. This is called identity denial. Their identity is called into question because they do not seem to match the prototype of the culture. And this is uh, James Franco and Halle Berry. Halle Berry's father was black and her mother was uh, English, I think. I, it, she may have been Italian, but she was white. Uh, James Franco's uh, uh, mother was a Russian, it was a, a Russian uh, Jewish person, and his father was Filipino. Uh, Filipino and, and like, Welsh or something. Anyway, he has Filipino blood. He also has Russian Jewish blood, um, which gives him darker, a little bit darker complexion and darker hair. And of course, Halle Berry has, has features that are similar to, to her mother, probably, uh, and her skin tone is a little darker than, than that. She's considered one of the more beautiful women in the world. These individuals probably have identity denial. Uh, I'm guessing uh, he probably, uh, uh, knowing James Franco, who just got in trouble, and we probably, we potentially won't be hearing much from him in the near future. Anyway, James Franco doesn't really talk about being Portuguese, and he doesn't talk about, and Halle Berry doesn't really talk about being white. In 1992, Steele identified a phenomenon that had puzzled psychometricians for decades. What was causing highly qualified African-American students to do worse in their studies? Steele's hypothesis is referred to as stereotype threat, a uh, fear that one might do something that will inadvertently confirm a negative stereotype about one's group. And of course, this is something that I, that I argue with uh, people about. Uh, you're fitting... You're fitting a stereotype. Please, please don't do that. Uh, I don't want you to fit a stereotype because stereotypes are, tend to be negative. After achieving acculturation, an immigrant becomes bicultural. The tendency for bicultural people to evince psychological tendencies between those of the two cultures is called blending. The uh, individual tends to switch between different cultural selves in a process known as frame switching or alternation. 
Inner city children, especially minorities, quickly learn to discriminate between the norms and unwritten rules that govern their schools and mainstream society and those that govern the streets. And this is known as code switching. It's an essential skill for inner city children to learn if they are to survive and succeed in these two divergent cultural contexts. you got to survive on the street. I, I had a student uh, when I was at Ashford. He was Hispanic, and there were Hispanic gangs around him, and he had to join a gang in order just to walk to school. Uh, while he was in school, uh, they weren't allowed to show colors. Uh, that's how they identified each group uh, or, or the different groups. Uh, but when he left the school, he had to put on his colors. Otherwise, he wouldn't have been able to, to get home. Uh, one of the interesting things uh, was that uh, after he came to Ashford, of course, he could discard all these. this code switching that was taking place, and he could just be a student. Uh, his roommate, <laughs> it turned out, and they didn't realize this because they didn't even talk about it. They just talked about their neighborhood, and they were from really close neighborhoods, um, and they didn't even think about it until they had been there for about six months. They both played soccer, and they were both really good. Um, but uh, when they, uh, one time, uh, one was going home, and he and he had he had his family car, and he was driving home. And he asked his roommate if he needed a ride to Chicago that weekend. The guy said, sure, that would be great. And uh, when he dropped him off, uh, the guy put on his colors so that he could, you know, get into his house. And the other guy realized that he was a member of a rival gang. Uh, and they kind of laughed about it later. Uh, when I talked to him, it was really kind of an interesting conversation because they were really serious. I mean, if you, you couldn't flash these colors uh, in school, and this is what would happen. They would keep a bandana in their pocket or something. And if somebody tried to give them a hard time, they'd pull out their bandana. Not completely, of course. They would show them their bandana to, to tell them, you better stay away from me or you're going to, if you mess with my buds, then, then you're in big time trouble. And it was really kind of a, a, an interesting situation. It was an interesting conversation uh, because, of course, being a naive Hoosier farm boy, not real bright and not really liking Chicago that much, uh, it was really a fascinating conversation uh, with these guys and how they had to code switch. Um, and they were best of friends, but uh, they couldn't be, they couldn't even interact when they were back in Chicago. Uh, they both they both graduated. I'm not exactly sure if they are friends now. If they moved out of the area. I have no idea what's happened with them. Uh, Anderson in 1999 argues that such children must learn to switch between code of the decent and the code of the street as they deal with people in their school culture and their street culture. The code of the street permeates many aspects of life, in particular, in particular the development of a reputation that one is tough and is not to be messed with. And of course, that was the idea behind my friend, or my, my two students. Multicultural is actually one of them. I, I didn't actually teach the other one, but uh, one of them I had in several classes. Multiculturals engage in frame switching through the language that they speak. The language that people speak seems to activate an associated cultural network, and this influences how they think. When bilinguals switch between languages, they are not just bringing different vocabularies and grammars to mind. They seem to be bringing different selves to mind as well. And you, as, as a multicultural frame-switching uh, Diné, can, can attest to this, that when you are speaking uh, Diné with your elders, uh, you may say things. You may act in one way uh, that you do not act when you're speaking English with uh, somebody else. Uh, I was who was I talking to? I was talking to somebody, and they were saying, "Well, you know, in some of our ceremonies, we refer to Billagana as the enemy." And I was thinking, "Geez, that's nice that you don't call me the enemy to my face <laughs> just in ceremonies." And I guess, I guess that's the way it works, anyway. Can't, can't argue with that. I'm not telling you I'm not the enemy. Researchers found that people who had lived in more than one culture were more likely to come up with outside-the-box creative solutions 
to a problem than those who have lived in only one culture. And this is according to Maddox and Galinsky in 2009. This is something that's really fascinating to me because I've lived in a lot of different cultures and sometimes people get stuck in the way that they, they think that they have to think as weird as that may sound, but if you have lived in another culture, you can think from, you can come at a problem from a different direction. Uh, let me give you a quick example. Um, uh, I used to, I, I, and I'm, I'm not really that good at, at dealing with things, uh, with dealing with physical things, but uh, sometimes a problem will come up uh, and I will have to fix it. I had to figure out how to create a step uh, and I kept thinking, well, this is a, a question of physics. Well, you know, uh, before I uh, taught at Ashford and had a really good friend who was a, uh, a physics major, I didn't really think of myself as thinking in terms of physics. But after uh, we had several uh, really interesting conversations, I realized that you can solve problems just by breaking it down into its physical aspects. This is physics. How in the world do I push this this 200-pound log up against something? That's what I had to figure out uh, a week ago. I was going to f uh, how I was going to uh, push it up and how I was going to maintain it because it kept rolling back down the hill. And eventually I rolled it up there on my knees and I secured it with a stake and then I staked it down with, with long stakes. And that's how I solved my problem. Now, you know, 20 years ago or 25 years ago, I might it, I made it may it, blah, blah, blah. it might have taken me forever to figure that uh, how to solve that problem. But because I was thinking, I need to think in a, a in physics. I need to think a uh, how would a would a physicist solve this problem? That's how I came up with a solution, and I have become much better at fixing things. You can ask my wife, I guess. <laughs> Maddox and Galinsky in 2009 further found that those who had merely visited other cultures as tourists did not show any comparative creative creativity advantage. Visiting other cultures is quite different from living in another culture because the former does not involve any adjustment on the part of the individual. And, and of course, uh, I can tell you that uh, adjusting to the uh, Diné culture um, uh, was was not e was not easy, especially easy. Uh, but uh, now that I have, uh, it, it has changed the way that I think. Adjusting to life in a new culture is more likely to provide one with an additional perspective, and this appears to be associated with enhanced creativity. One reason that multicultural experiences foster creative thinking is that living in different cultures fosters a way of thinking called integrative complexity, a willingness and ability to acknowledge and consider different viewpoints on the same issue. And that's what happened with me and physics. And that is the finally the end of the chapter. This is kind of a long one. So I apologize for that. Next week, we will just tackle chapter eight. <laughs>